the cannulation uh, so in vv ecmo we normally do either pim pim bilateral femoral pam jugular or single avalon cannula to be honest i have done pam pam i have done pam jugular but i haven't done single avalon cannula i don't know it's very complicated and it's very tricky to insert and uh, so i just uh, i'll just talk about pam pam and pam jugular and pam pam cannula the so just insert cannula as uh, we do the center line and then it should be the level is important so level should be either uh, l1 or l2 ideally it should be above the it should be below the renal vein so that we can take the um, as much as flow we can take from hepatic vein from renal vein so it should be at the level of l1 l2 and return cannula should be at the level of t10 and t12 at the junction of uh, ivc and right atrium this is the ideal position where our cannula should be but in practice it doesn't happen that's why there is so many episodes of uh, recirculations and desaturation so there is reason because in when we insert a uh drainage cannula drainage cannulas are most of the time they are multi stage cannulas multi stage means there are multiple multiple uh holes or faces in the multi stage cannula it's just to increase the ecmo blood flow so that they can suck out blood from everywhere but in practice uh when uh, there was a study and they saw it on mri as well it's the proximal port which is the most important port in the drainage of the blood so proximal port that's why even when a patient's cannula are very near still patient doesn't recirculate so proximal port is the most important port and all the most of the blood is coming through the port, proximal port smaller cannulas 15 to 19 french are sufficient for venous return and uh, tip of the cannula should be at the level of atrial cavel junction which i told you before and uh, the correct position of cannula is done that's very important to prevent the recirculation uh, normally uh, we used uh, fluoroscopy most of the time 90% uh, i used fluoroscopy in inserting vv acmos 10 15 time um, percent time we use either toe or tt so whenever we were going for retrieval we were taking toe pro with us and the toe machine with us it's a portable toe machine if a fluoroscopy is not available we were doing just toe guided ecmo cannulation it's just to see the tip of uh, your ecmo cannula so that's why so choosing the size of drainage cannula that's also very important because if you are putting a small size cannula you will not get uh, good blood flow and your patient will not get benefit so this just a crude method you just measure the vessel diameter on ultrasound it should be 10 mm and then you can calculate with the help of this uh, circumference so and maximum size of cannula is 31 so normally in uh 70 60 60 60 kg 70 kg patient so our drainage cannula used to be like 25 to uh, mostly it was 25 pints and return cannula size doesn't matter it can be of any size so these are this is this is the arterial cannula i'm not going to talk about arterial but it's used in vecmo this is the venous the blue one you can see this venous cannula there are multiple small 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 pores and uh, there is a one distal port as well this is the uh, cell dinger or you can say guide wire or inside the port it will come out later on and drainage uh, and the return cannulas are normally of a uh, single uh, not multi stage single hole cannula which goes by uh, the right ijv or it can be bifemoral as well so alternative way of establishing i don't know if someone has used this avalon cannula before i never used but it has uh, three ports proximal middle and distal is uh, the uh, positive point with avalon cannula is uh, you just have to use one cannula you don't have to puncture two venous sites you can just do it right internal jugular and uh, the distal port it located at the uh, in the 
just below the uh, below the atrial and IVC junction, and it drains the blood from the inferior vena cava. And the proximal pore drains the blood from the superior vena cava, and the middle pore rests in the right atrium. And it, it this is important. It should face the tricuspid wall. It should be in the right atrium, facing the tricuspid wall, and then it returns oxygenated blood from ECMO circuit. This is the ablon cannula. This is uh, uh, here. It's the uh, excess. This is the return, and this is the oxygenated blood coming here. This is the fem fem configuration. This is the fem jugular configuration. You can see. Uh, this is the drainage cannula, which is just above the renal veins, and uh, this is the return cannula, which is going up to the uh, atrial cavity junction so that we can return the oxygenated blood in, uh, near the tricuspid wall and it goes back to the uh, pulmonary artery. So, this is the basic configuration uh, for FEM jugular. We are taking blood from the and the vena cava, it's passing through the pump, uh, then through the oxygenator, and there is a sweep gas here where we control the oxygenation and carbon dioxide. So this sweep gas should be attached to the membrane from where we are going to give the oxygen to the membrane, and then it's going back to the right internal jugular. So this basic configuration of a uh, uh, VV ECMO. So after you insert guide wire, just before cannula placement, a bolus of heparin should be given to target ACT 180 to And uh, it's not uh, mandatory, it depends. Uh, uh, if patient is very coagulopathic, we can avoid this, but normally uh, our patients are mostly RDS patients. Um, so after cannulation, we start flow slowly to 2.5 to 3 liters, keeping the hemodynamic, because if you remove fluid very quickly or blood very quickly, patient will be very hemodynamically unstable and then typically increase the ECMO flow to 3 to 4 liter. It should ideally be 60% of your cardiac output. And in the absence of high risk circulation, this 60% uh, of uh, cardiac output ratio should be good enough to maintain the blood oxygenation. CO2 elimination depends on the sweep gas. And the rate of sweep gas you can determine according to your PCO2 and how much sweep you need and how much your native lungs are functioning. This is the sweep gas and oxygen blender. Normally in VV ECMO, we keep FiO to 100%. And V ECMO, you can change it. And this is the sweep. And we can go up with sweep and go down with the sweep. Sweep works as a just a minute ventilation in a VV ECMO. This is the structure of a <clears throat> gas exchanger. This is our, our membrane. So in membrane, inside there is gas, it's mostly oxygen and blood goes outside. Blood, and, uh, because of uh, just the diffusion, oxygen goes in and CO2 comes out. That's, this is a very basic uh, uh, mechanism of working of uh, membranes. And uh, there are multiple parts of ECMO. So after inserting cannula, um, um, the blood goes through the circuit to the pump, then goes through the membrane, and then come, goes back to the patient. And I think Saurabh already spoke about uh, uh, our console and everything, so I'm not going into that details. Uh, anticoagulation is important in ACMO. So normally, heparin is the um, anticoagulation of choice. And uh, no, we no, don't choose uh, APGT. We keep uh, NT10 in 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. That's the, our target. And we use uh, NT10 as a anticoagulation mark. And, and we do it every 6 to 12 hourly, depending on the situation. Also, we do fibrinogen and platelet count. So we do platelet counts daily, fibrinogen daily, to, and then our target is to keep fibrinogen more than 1.5 and platelet 50 to uh, 100,000 if there is no active bleeding. If there is any active bleeding, we can do TAG as well. In case of patient is a uh, hit positive, so we use ergotroban and uh, we keep our uh, APTT. Uh, we normally use APTTR and we keep it in 1.5 to 2 or maybe 70 to 90 APTT and ergotroban. The problem with ergotroban, we cannot reverse it and uh, it's very expensive as well. So coming to the complications of VV ECMO and, and uh, the, uh, what's the troubleshooting. So most importantly, there may be clot in the um, membrane. So normally this is the normal clot where we take the blood, but this clot in the middle of the membrane, it's not very good. And uh, 
it will impair your oxygenation it will cause increase the pressure of the ecmo membrane and it will increase the risk of rupture as well so yes if there is clotting you have to change the circuit and you have to change the uh, ox membrane oxygenator as well cannula complication if there is uh, lots of recirculation so first is normal second one is recirculation as you can see uh, return cannula and uh, an excess cannula both are of same color so definitely here it, there is significant recirculation is going on in this uh, in this situation other complications are hemolysis because uh, membranes are foreign objects. So how do we find out patient is hemolyzing? So we normally do simple tests like LDH, D-dimer, fibrinogen, and indirect bilirubin. And if there is a hemolysis, we just change the circuit after that, keeping most of the time changing circuit uh, sort out the hemolysis problem. If there is any intracranial hemorrhage or if there is any active bleeding yes we can continue ecmo without anticoagulation for some time depending on the situation we have continued ecmo without anticoagulation for seven to ten days or maybe longer but yes you can keep uh, a patient without anticoagulation if there is a uh, charter or uh, suck down if we are circuit is uh, swinging and it's giving you like it's uh, something is uh, it's trying to suck out it means your patient is uh, intravascularly depleted or your cannula is misplaced so uh, i think uh, giving fluid and uh, it's a good option you should give some fluid so that uh, you can maintain the cardiac output and you can keep the, your inferior vena cava full full with the blood so that there is no suck down or no chattering so i already spoke uh, told you about hemolysis and uh, ventilator management so normally recommended plateau pressure because uh, the whole purpose of doing ecmo is to give rest to lungs so normally we keep uh, a plateau pressure below 20 p around 10 respiratory rate 4 to 15 and a pi to as low as possible. That's the recommended setting, but we can manipulate setting according to the clinical condition of the patient. Um, so last thing I want to talk about, uh, uh, weaning from ECMO. So once you think that patient's respiratory compliance has gone up and uh, now his pi to is also less than 50% and uh, patient uh, doesn't uh, need uh, very much lung injuring ventilator setting. So what we can do, we can reduce the oxygen. So in blender, there is an option. You can go down with a pio 2 as you go in, down in ventilator and increase the ventilatory support. So stepwise reduce the oxygenation on the blender, keep saturation more than 92%. And if patient is not desaturating, then we can go down with sweep and look at the carbon dioxide and the respiratory uh, pattern of the patient. If CO2 is not going up and the patient is not very breathless or is not breathing nicely, then uh, it's also an indication that patient is uh, doing well. Third is that we do the off sweep gas chill and we keep patients without sweep uh, for 24 hours. So if a patient is without sweep, it means that your oxygen, your membrane is not oxygenated it means your, uh, your ECMO is just uh, circulating. It's not uh, contributing to oxygenation or it's not contributing to maintaining saturation. It's just all work is done, being done by your ventilator. So after if patient passes this test, that means patient is ready for decannulation. And after that, we just do the decannulation. Mm -hmm.